Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Investigating Consciousness with Closed-Loop Neural Reinforcement, presented by Aurelio Cortez. He is a researcher at Advanced Telecommunications Research Institute International. I am Marjorie Torres of Labritz, and I will be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type your questions into the drop-down box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the Help Desk button located in the promotional board at the bottom or center of your screen, or use the Ask a Question box to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Aurelio Cortese. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Thank you, Marge. And today, I will talk about some uh, recent experiments that we have been uh, working on investigating some of the neural basis and functions of uh, consciousness. And this with a um, new and sophisticated uh, MRI-based uh, approach. Investigating consciousness with closed-loop neural reinforcement. So we'll first give you a brief uh, introduction on consciousness in the brain. There are, it's, uh, uh, there are several debates on that. And after that, I will go on with uh, uh, talking a bit about this uh, approach that we've been using, um, using uh, this uh, multivariate, multivoxel approaches uh, uh, to train brain activity. And then I will introduce three different uh, um, experiment studies that we've been running here uh, in Japan uh, that go from, uh, let's say, simpler uh, information in the brain, representation about orientation, to more uh, concept, to more, let's say, higher order, and uh, abstract representation. And finally, what would uh, these results that we obtain mean for uh, studies of consciousness? So for consciousness in the brain, uh, first of all, I think we need to give, a, let's say, to see a definition of what is consciousness. And I think there are, we can uh, define this in two different ways. One is uh, simply by uh, uh, account Accounting for the levels of consciousness. And here we, we for an example, we have a wakefulness or you have a sleep. But for, uh, let's say, our purpose, it's actually more interesting uh, to look at consciousness not in terms of whether there is or not consciousness in terms of like these levels, but what consciousness means in the brain. And, and for example, if a person uh, is conscious, if you have a conscious percept, this uh, one of the of the uh, theories would say that this accounts to have a global availability of information, and that you also have uh, self monitoring processes. Therefore, we can uh, we can see several aspects of of, the, of consciousness and of conscious percept. So you have obviously perceptual awareness when it, when it's related to a perception, qualia in terms of uh, of an actual uh, uh, single unique concept uh, conscious uh, percept. And then self-awareness, which is the, obviously the, the consciousness about oneself and what we are, at what time, what are we doing. And if we look then uh, uh, at, the, at the literature, there are several uh, different uh, approaches that, that have been uh, that, uh, to, to look at, uh, at consciousness, basically. And in terms of the actual the, the brain, there's also controversy, obviously. There are several uh, researchers uh, that have um, highlighted possible uh, neural substrates in different brain areas. And this go from the visual areas to the parietal areas of the brain to the frontal areas, and even uh, in the deeper brain uh, nuclei. But so given all these uh, different uh, ideas and approaches and theories in the studies of consciousness, um, I think 
one of the of the areas that uh, that is very likely to be involved, at least from our point of view, is the prefrontal cortex. And there are several reasons for that. Um, here, I just uh, I'm just giving some of the of the possible uh, uh, literature um, that also highlights the the, the possible uh, involvement of the prefrontal cortex in conscious perception. But the idea is that the, all the prefrontal cortices are involved in, uh, in higher order thoughts and higher order representation. Nevertheless, there are uh, several uh, researchers and studies that also seem to, to say to point to the that uh, prefrontal cortex itself is not necessary for consciousness, but rather it's an area that is simply involved in the fact that as, uh, as humans, uh, we are uh, reporting our conscious experiences. But for the actual sub substrates of uh, a conscious experience, a single conscious percept, prefrontal cortex is not needed. And in our view, prefrontal cortex is necessary, and uh, a way to look at that is to, to think of confidence. So. Uh, when we when we make decisions, or when we uh, basically when we have uh, uh, perceptual uh, experiences, usually this is uh, is also paired with uh, this uh, certain confidence uh, uh, feeling, feeling of certainty. And the idea is that this reflects consciousness, because um, if we are conscious of uh, of something, then we also likely so uh, let's say we have seen it, and. Um, we will also have this, this feeling of certainty that we have seen something. On the other hand, uh, when let's see, if, if I think now, oh, have I seen that uh, that bat here in the sand or the dog? Well, I'm not sure because maybe it's too small or maybe the image is noisy. And because of that, we see this link between uh, confidence and consciousness. And if I go forward and define, I give, let's say, a definition of confidence. Confidence, working definition that we can actually use in experiments, then I would say that confidence is the certainty that my decision was correct. And this actually can also raise the question that is then uh, confidence of the probability of being correct? Because normally, if we think of, uh, of even of a, of a simple task uh, in which one has to make choices, usually we have that the, the accuracy in the task and the confidence are uh, very much correlated. So it's actually it's difficult to dissociate it. And to continue on this, we have obviously, there are several, uh, uh, oops, okay. So there, are, there, there has been uh, several uh, published papers that have uh, shown that, uh, that actually you have even the same neuronal substrates that encode uh, the decision, but also the confidence. And one of those examples is this uh, 2009 science paper by Bruce Bacchiani and Chadlin, where they show where they showed that there were neurons in the parietal cortex that were encoding both the confidence and the decision. And given this, then it seems okay. Well, then the two are actually uh, uh, the same neurons encode these two uh, uh, different uh, behavioral variables. So then perhaps uh, we actually don't need to even think of the uh, uh, prefrontal cortex. Nevertheless. When we, especially when we uh, when we study uh, confidence in humans, then the picture is is quite different. And one of these examples is uh, is this uh, paper in 2010 that showed that applying uh, trans uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation to prefrontal cortex completely degraded confidence ratings. Because nowadays ratings they were not any more uh, diagnostic of the uh, accuracy in the task, but they were a bit more random. And there are also there are actually uh, other uh, studies that have shown that it's possible to dissociate this uh, accuracy and the confidence. And because of this, this gives a kind of um, two different ways, two different uh, hypotheses in how confidence is actually uh, computed by the brain. The first one is the normative hypothesis that is. I would say that uh, you can define it as confidence that directly reflects sensory evidence. And because of this, we would have the same neural substrates that encodes confidence and perceptual evidence, as it has already been shown. So if we trust that view, then we have the same neuronal substrate that encodes confidence and the perceptual evidence and the choices. On the other hand, if we think of the metacognitive hypothesis, then confidence is, uh, is, it is obviously related to the perceptual evidence and the choices, but is, um, is dissociable from it because uh, it's a late stage uh, estimation. And therefore, given these two hypotheses, these two, these two views, 
if we apply, for example, uh, this uh, TS uh, that uh, basically can uh, um, disrupt the, the processing in the in, in the in the specific area where it is applied, then these two hypotheses should leave should should lead to two different uh, uh, predictions. And I would argue also that uh, TMS, in a way, is a, is a very coarse uh, manipulation or uh, disruption, because somehow, actually, it, it could just uh, basically increase the noise in the system. And so our idea was, let's use a more sophisticated approach so that we can uh, actually manipulate, uh, for example, confidence bidirectionally and really see if the two can be dissociated functionally. So to do this, or uh, what I would call a sophisticated closed-loop multivoxel training is an fMRI-based uh, approach. That is that when you think of representations, computations, and the link between brain and behavior, and look at the brain, there are obviously several ways to, to, uh, um, to try to understand this in the brain. And one of them is by using uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, so fMRI in short, where uh, we, we can estimate uh, signal changes in the brain, but not directly, so it doesn't directly measure the, the neural activity, but uh, as a surrogate for it, measure the, the oxygen level in the blood. And, and then this blood flow at this oxygen level uh, uh, dependency change, changes based on the, on the task and, uh, and on the areas of the brain involved. But now in the past, the way of looking at this, uh, at this fMRI data was simply in a univariate way. So you just do like some general statistics in a given area. But uh, in the last, let's say, 10 years, so this is, I started already before, but in the last 10 years, there's, there have been really a very big growth in the, the usage of these multivariate approaches, where instead of just using some summary statistics, one actually uh, tries to, uh, to, to make use of all the information within uh, a certain number of voxels. So voxels is a, is a unit of, um, is a small, basically, like a pixel in 2D, voxel is high, a pixel in 3D. And you have here that for these multivariate approaches, one looks also at the relationship between the different uh, voxels of these uh, different activities and try to, to make use also of these correlations between this. So then the information that one can get out of it is much richer. So the way we, we generally apply this uh, is uh, we do some standard uh, fMRI preprocessing, but then we use uh, for each single voxel that we're interested in the brain, we, uh, we extract the, like some time course and then we apply this uh, uh, machine learning technique. So in, in our case, we use the, what we call sparse logistic regression. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a relatively standard and simple uh, machine learning approach, but which has a, a, a strong uh, assumption. In this case, it's, the, the assumption is about sparseness, which means that within a given area, we assume that most of the voxels are actually irrelevant for the task or for the variable of interest. And this actually allows uh, in the end, to have a uh, much finer uh, resolution. For the actual, uh, what I would call this closed-loop ne uh, neural reinforcement, it is, a, let's say, a fairly uh, simple uh, process. Let's say we have a participant in the scanner. We have a, a template uh, a decoder, a template uh, activation pattern, let's say, in a, in a given area, for example, in the prefrontal cortex, so what we do is that we ask participants in the scanner to just try to, to manipulate the activity to change the brain activity while they see this cue at uh, induction time. But what we do as experimenter is that uh, uh, through uh, with uh, our uh, decoder, um, we, on, we, we do this uh, online decoding of this brain activity. And so essentially this would, in very simple terms, would account to somehow compare uh, two different activation patterns and give a, a feedback score. There is a score that um, the current activation pattern is as close as possible to the target. So if it's very close, this feedback this will be large. If it's actually different, this feedback uh, circle will be smaller. And importantly, there's two, two aspects of it. And the first one is that participants receive a monetary reward based on the size of the disk, so that they are motivated to perform well. And the second aspect is that they are not aware of the um, of the goal of this uh, training. So we don't tell them what is it that they are trying to induce in the brain. We just tell them that they should uh, try to manipulate the brain activity. As I was saying, this we call this decoding neurofeedback. 
feedback because we have a decoder, a machine learning classifier, and it's a neural feedback paradigm. So that is a space on neural activity, and we feedback this neural activity in real time to participants. As I was saying, this essentially accounts to comparing two different activation patterns, the current one and a uh, target one. And with this, then one can measure if we do, because we induce brain activity, we can, uh, we can simply do a, a behavioral test, for example, before and after the training to see if this has led to any changes in behavior, for example, in our dependent variable. So as I was uh, mentioning at the beginning, we, we did several studies using uh, this uh, decoded neurofeedback. And uh, this uh, was, uh, we're ranging from uh, simpler uh, approaches, let's say from simple working on simple representations, for a grating orientation, to more uh, higher order and abstract uh, uh, brain representation. In, in, in this first study here, the idea was that uh, we had participants come for two, uh, initially for two days. The first day was to uh, uh, do a retinotopy scan it's, uh, this essentially is uh, um, being in the scanner, we see some uh, very simple basic visual stimuli that are uh, tuned so that we can uh, clearly define the different visual areas in our uh, occipital cortex. And then in this case, because in this case we were interested in this orientation, and these are, uh, are let's say, lower, uh, lower level um, features and therefore are easily found, or the information about this uh, orientation is easily found in the visual cortices. And participants came for what we call this uh, MVPA session, which stands for Model Pattern Analysis Session. So during this session, participants would just do a, uh, a very simple task in, in, in which they have to, to pay attention to some stimuli. The idea is that we use it to, um, to have the uh, fMRI signal that we can use for our decoding for our classifier. So the aim of this uh, of this study here was to uh, reduce fear responses to some uh, threat signal, but to do this unconsciously. So to do this below the, the level of consciousness. And to do that, participants came and uh, aside from the first two days of uh, retinotopy and, uh, and decoding construction, they were they were then uh, uh, subjected to to this uh, training. Where first during the acquisition time. They were uh, shown different stimuli for which sometimes some of them were paired with electric shocks. So now they became uh, conditioned to have a fear response to this, uh, um, uh, to this uh, visual stimuli. Then they underwent this uh, neural reinforcement training. And finally, uh, we, at the end, we did uh, another test session to see whether uh, the, the target um, con um, condition stimulus was still fearful or not. And in terms of the of the actual uh, uh, visual stimuli that were used, we used this uh, uh, different color grating, and um, in this case we uh, we decoded uh, the color, whether it was uh, red or green. The idea was that uh, one of these stimuli was the target condition stimulus, and the other one was the control. So both of them are uh, become fearful because they are uh, during this acquisition time they are paired with a uh, uh, with a uh, electric shock but only one of these will be um, actually uh, uh, the brain will be trained to lose this fear so in this uh, induction and uh, um, let's say online training neural reinforcement training the the, the visual stimulus was only about the, the orientation so it was it was achromatic and it was a vertical orientation so there was no information on whether it would be the target or the control uh, stimulus. And what we show is that uh, if we compare the fear responses, so the fear responses in this case, we use two different measures. One of them, the skin distance, that is how, how much the skin can uh, conduce electricity. And that is usually because if, if one is fearful, um, we, we, uh, uh, we sweat a little bit on our skin and therefore the, the skin conductance becomes higher. And so what we show here is that uh, during, uh, at the end of the acquisition period, so before the training, both the target and the control condition stimuli have the same level uh, of uh, associated fear. The, 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 this SCR measure is exactly the same. But nevertheless, if we look at the end of this, uh, after this neural training, now we see that this uh, SCR measure has decreased, is significantly lower for the, um, 
only for the target uh, condition stimulus. So this actually clearly says that uh, only the target for which the basically brain activation were, uh, were reinforced in this training had an effect, as a physiological effect, not for the control which was, uh, was, had been untrained. And a second way to look at this, that there's a physiological fear response, is to look at the, at the amygdala. And this is because the amygdala generally is the, is the brain, single brain region, which is mostly associated with, uh, with uh, fear responses. And we see the same pattern, uh, actually. And we see that uh, at the end of the, of the acquisition, we have the same level of uh, amygdala activity for both the target and the control conditions. You know? So both of them, when they are shown on the screen, a participant has, a, let's say, a fear response. But again, at the end of, the, of this the neural reinforcement uh, training, now we see that for the only for and this only for the target condition stimulus we have a reduction of this uh, amygdala activity, and uh, and this goes again to say that uh, we have now two measures of uh, uh, basically fear reduction, and that is the, so the neural reinforcement training had this strong physiological effect, but there was a very interesting point is that participants had at no time awareness of the target condition stimulus, the color grating, uh, during the training. So this, the information about, this, uh, about the condition stimulus was present during the neural reinforcement because uh, we were measuring this brain activity in real time and whenever the, 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 this uh, target condition stimulus activation pattern was present, a reward was given. But when uh, we asked participants at the end of the, of the experiment, whether uh, which one was the condition, the control or the target condition stimulus, there were a chance at the group level regarding which group they were. So uh, they really had no awareness uh, at all about this uh, stimulus itself. Now, now I said, okay, well, this is just uh, because this, so we have these uh, representations, but these are low level, it's, let's say orientation or color in the visual area. So perhaps if we go a bit uh, in, in the higher order uh, regions, and we do the same kind of training, then perhaps participants at one point may become conscious about it because perhaps if the representation of the information is something uh, a little bit more, a little bit con more conceptual or high order, then maybe it's perhaps it's enough to reach consciousness. And to that end, we did uh, a, um, a second study, also in a way also to, to, to replicate the previous one. And this time it was about reinforcing in conceptual representations. The approach was slightly different in that we, we also wanted to, uh, to test whether it was possible to uh, do this kind of training by taking, let's say, go one step forward and take a brain activation pattern from subject one and translate this activation pattern into the brain coordinates of subject two, and then do the training in subject two with this activation pattern. This is, uh, sounds uh, almost uh, crazy, but it has been developed already a few years ago by uh, James Hugsby and colleagues at uh, Dartmouth. And essentially, uh, what participants do in the scanner, they, uh, in, in our case, they were doing an end back task in which the idea is it's a very simple task. They are shown uh, different images that uh, each, each one belonging to a specific category. And it's very simple. You just have to press a button whenever the category changes. So here in this example, you can see that you have, we have three images of a snake, and then suddenly the next image is a, is a butterfly. So the first uh, butterfly image uh, comes to the, to the screen. Participants have to report this change. And so in this experiment, there's all four categories that were belonging to either uh, objects or animals. And... Uh, we had several participants. In the end, there were at least uh, 29 that were used uh, as uh, surrogate uh, participants to, uh, to find the activation, the target activation pattern in the designated participant for, you know, for uh, the, uh, the actual training. So the, this, this kind of approach then can be used obviously for each, uh, for each participant that, uh, that comes through the experiment, uh, can be a surrogate for all the others and can be designated for itself. The idea is that we take, we can take the activation patterns, and we use in this case the ventral 
to tempura, as this as it's an area known for uh, representing uh, is a categorical conceptual representation of uh, objects or um, animals. And that is that this is a, it's an iterative process where we take an activation pattern several uh, participants and we try to bring them all together to a common hyperspace and doing this by, by, by simple tra linear transformation. That is, uh, we just try to find the perfect, uh, no, the, 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 the best combination uh, in terms of, uh, of a vector of, of voxels so that uh, we have for the same uh, uh, category with the maximum predictive accuracy for all the, subject, all the subjects. And because we do this transformation from the native space of a given participant to the common space, huh? we can basically, then it becomes easy to, to apply in either direction this transformation. So now we can, uh, once we have this, build this uh, common space, we can take a new pattern from a surrogate participant, it from his native space to his common abstract space, and then we can, uh, applying the, um, the transformation matrix of our target of our designated participant, we can obtain the target pattern for this designated participant. And in the common space, this is a general pattern that is general for all the set, all the participants. But the, for the designated one, is a unique is a unique pattern that uh, is is, uh, is represented in its own uh, brain coordinates. And so for this, we uh, again in, in in this case, we also try to to reduce fear response to common object again unconsciously. So I wanted to see even if we use high order representation, can this still be unconscious? And uh, if it is unconscious, then again, this could be an extremely powerful approach to uh, uh, at least to, to combine for uh, uh, interventions to, to reduce fear in, uh, for example, in phobic uh, participants, in, in phobic uh, patients. The idea for the for the experiment itself was uh, was the same as the previous study, in which uh, we have uh, several data of uh, uh, um, of neural reinforcement training. But before and after that, we also do a uh, uh, basically uh, we also record the, the fear responses to this to the different categories and see how this uh, uh, if the if the physiological fear then have changed after this new reinforcement. So our target is we would like to see a reduction in the fear responses, both in terms of this skin conduct sense response and amygdala activity only for the target uh, category. So I actually I forgot, but I should mention that uh, the different um, categories that were used for, the, for, the, for this training, there was always one um, control and one target uh, object. And the objects themselves were, before starting the experiment, participants rated each one of these animals and objects in terms of how fearful they were. And for each one, we selected the two most fearful objects or, um, or uh, uh, animal. And the computer itself decided which one was the control and which one was the target for fear to be reduced. So this, this then becomes a completely double... Uh, uh, double-blind placebo control experiments because neither the the participant nor the experimenter knows which one is the target and which one is the uh, uh, controller in this case. The, um, for the neural reinforcement training, this was exactly done exactly the same way as for the previous study. These participants tried to induce activation pattern in the brain. We use our uh, decoder where we did, we can basically compare the different activation patterns, the current one and the target one, and then we can give a feedback score that account to some uh, monetary reward. And in these two, what we see, we see that there is a strong decrease in the physiological uh, fear response that follows this neural reinforcement. So here you have uh, the wide bars are before and after for the target condition, and you see that there is a, uh, a significant decrease in the um, in the in this physiological response. But this is not the case for the control condition. So again, this is a, the the intervention was specific for the target um, fearful uh, condition. And so again, here we have that we have strong physiological effect, 
but no awareness of the identity of the target category. So again, we asked participants at the end of the experiment which one they thought was the, the target and which one they thought was the, the, the control, but at the group level, there were a chance. So they had no uh, insight into this information that was, uh, um, let's say, repeatedly uh, present in their own uh, brain now. So again, now it seems that we, we, we went a bit higher up in terms of uh, representation in the brain, but still participants are, are completely unconscious about the about DESA. So it seems that we need something else, maybe something higher. Perhaps we could think of something even higher order instead of just concept. Now, and this was our uh, it's the third experiment I present here, and now it's a, it's an abstract representation somehow because confidence confidence report in in a way it's a so it's obviously based on some certainty measure that can also be represented uh, by uh, by neurons themselves. But overall, confidence, our sense of certainty in our decision and so on, this is something that is, we can say it's quite abstract and, uh, and high level, higher order in terms of, uh, of brain regions as well. Essentially, the, the, for the task itself, the structure was similar to the previous one in that we also wanted to have to functionally define the visual areas with a retinotopy scan. And, and we then had participants do, again, what we call this uh, multivoxel pattern analysis session. So during this session, participants were doing a simple um, perceptual decision-making task. They were presented with um, random dot motion. The dot point here is indicated by the, by the stimulus. Um, a small slide. The dot, some of the dots were moving to the right or left. So importantly, the, the percentage of dots with a coherent direction was very small, so that the task was difficult by design. Participants were asked to make uh, this perceptual decision, either right or left, and then read their confidence from one to four. Four standing for certainty, and one for the when they were pre like really guessing and completely uncertain about um, their choice. So again, here confidence is the confidence about the decision. It is how certain, how sure, uh, you are that your choice was correct. And we did our analysis, uh, our decoding analysis in several brain areas. And those that we thought were the most relevant for, uh, for confidence, based on, on the literature and on previous studies, also by our, our group, uh, there were three subregions of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the inferior parietal. But we were also interested in the visual areas because here we're talking about uh, visual perception, and because if confidence and the accuracy uh, and the decision itself are very tightly correlated, and following some of the uh, of the hypotheses in the field may actually be encoded by the same brain a region and neurons and neural circuitry, then perhaps we can actually decode confidence already in the lower visual areas. But what we see in terms of results. Is, a, is a, at least in terms of brain regions, is a dissociation uh, in terms of the confidence. So if we try to decode, to classify high versus low confidence based on brain activation patterns, we see that this can be, uh, cannot be done above chance in the visual areas, but can be done much above chance in the frontal parietal areas. So now we have uh, signals in the brain in this more higher order frontal regions, prefrontal regions, that can classify confidence, but cannot in the visual areas. But nevertheless, at the moment, this doesn't, doesn't tell us anything on whether um, conscious, uh, confidence is encoded in a, let's say, in a separate way and, uh, and by, by different neural uh, substrate than these two other uh, behavioral variables. So the perception and whether the, trial, the, the task and the trial were correct or incorrect. So obviously, if these are encoded by the same, uh, um, let's say, neural substrates, if we apply this uh, neural feedback, uh, neural reinforcement um, approach on confidence, but if these are linked together, then we can, uh, we will be, we will actually uh, uh, behaviorally, we will provoke changes, both probably both in confidence, but also in the accuracy of the task. Or, uh, or induce a bias in on, uh, on left or right responses. For the, for the actual training, we had some of the participants in total 10 come back to do this uh, counterbalanced uh, two-block uh, two uh, training. 
So each participant did two different uh, training, once for high and once for low confidence. And these were counterbalanced. So that's why we have two different groups. And on each day, so on each block, they did first a pretest. So this is the same behavioral task that uh, I showed you earlier for the construction of the decoder itself and the post-test as well. So now we can compare before and after the training how confidence or how other behavioral measures changed. And what we uh, and what we had them is that they had to wait one week and then we had them come back again to do the opposite training. So essentially this accounts to reinforcing the current confidence activation patterns. So during the actual training, we use these uh, four different brain uh, uh, regions with so four different decoders. And the task here for, in terms of the participants was identical as the previous uh, studies I showed you. So that during the induction time, participants were just uh, focusing on trying to modulate change of brain activity in order to maximize some feedback score. But in terms of uh, as experimenter, this feedback score was computed uh, based on, um, on the output of these four decoders and then average to give this feedback score. And, and uh, as I was uh, indicating earlier, the larger the disk size, the larger the feedback size, the larger the, the monetary reward that the participant gets at the end of the experiment. And um, this size of the disk increased maximally when the likelihood of the target activation pattern was maximal. And this both in the case of low and high confidence training. So in both cases, the goal of the in terms of the participant here was to maximize the size of this disk. And so what do we see in this pre and post test? So let's have a look at that. So we see that we have bidirectional confidence changes. Now we have that when participants trained on, the, on, on inducing high confidence patterns, now they became more confident uh, in doing the, this uh, perceptual task. But they became less confident when they trained in, uh, in the low confidence uh, neurofeedback. And now, this is a, it's a specific result. And this is interesting because now we see that there is no effect whatsoever on the task accuracy. So the level before and after this neural training is completely unchanged in terms of the accuracy. And this is an interesting point because now we have, we have a dissociation between the two, as has been already shown in the past. But now that this dissociation was done at the, somehow the neural level. And here I'm showing you the correlation between the ability of inducing a target activity pattern. So the more you go to the right side, the higher the likelihood of high confidence induction. The more you go to the left side, the lower high confidence, but the higher the low confidence induction. And you can see that it relates very well with the actual confidence changes. So somehow these results here for this confidence uh, training, they give strong support for this metacognitive hypothesis. That confidence is a late stage estimation. That is confidence, we have manipulated confidence representation in the brain, in the prefrontal cortex, and that these are uh, somehow different from the, according to the perceptual evidence and of the, of the decision itself. But not only different in terms of the behavior, uh, of the behavior itself, because these are obviously are, but in terms of the neural substrates. So we have a different circuitry that, uh, that is basically computing this different uh, variable. And given these results, it, it would seem that at least for this kind of task and this kind of approach, the normative uh, hypothesis is not really plausible because if it were the case, then if we're changing confidence, then we should also see a, uh, an effect on the, on the sensory evidence, which should also trigger changes in the, in the perceptual accuracy in the task and perhaps also biases. But the interesting thing is that, again, we have strong behavioral effect, but again, we have no awareness of this activation pattern content during the neural reinforcement. So when people were, were trying to manipulate or change their brain activity, so we didn't tell them what was the, the, the purpose or the goal of that part, but they had no awareness of the activation pattern, whether it was a low or high confidence. And we asked them again at the end of the, of the training, which order they did first, and they don't know, they had chance. So it seems that when we take all this uh, data, all these results together, from all the several approaches where we trained the brain to induce neural activity uh, in several different areas, several different, uh, let's say, order of, uh, how do you say, let's say, um, conceptual knowledge from, uh, from very simple color orientation to higher order uh, confidence. 
So this should mean something in terms of the, of the studies of consciousness. And I think it's the main question actually we can ask here is that again, to go back to, to the two main uh, um, theories of consciousness is, is localized focal activity enough to give rise to a uh, conscious percept? Or we need some, or we, or we need more than that. Do we need uh, perhaps some uh, generalized uh, network activation? So we need the activity that is spread over several brain areas, and we need connectivity, or let's say, uh, cross-talking between different uh, nerves and different areas. Or perhaps we also need, uh, due to this, we also need to have some higher order representation of the of the lower one. That is, we need so we have a lower order representation of, uh, let's say, of an object. Of a, of a concept, but we need to have a higher order representation of that, and this perhaps is only available if there is a, a generalized activation. And indeed, so what I would argue is that prefrontal cortex is needed for the uh, for consciousness as as a, as a neural basis of consciousness. Obviously, with, with the data, the results I showed you here, we cannot directly tell this because in all different uh, uh, studies, there was actually no conscious percept about the, the information present in the brain at, uh, at those specific time points during the neural training. But because of the, um, especially of the line targeting confidence, where we see that confidence is encoded in the prefrontal cortex, and confidence, we can directly relate it to the conscious experience. At least now we, we, we could say that uh, um, it is likely that confidence and consciousness share also the same uh, neural substrate, that is the prefrontal cortex. So to go back to these two different views of uh, localized focal activity, which I could, uh, we could call local recurrent processing, that is this, this posits that we are, you, it's, to have a conscious percept, we only need activation in a localized, uh, well-defined region, while if we think of this global broadcasting, which is another uh, aspect of, uh, of the consciousness, uh, another theory of consciousness, then here we need these uh, this, uh, connectivities and, and, and large activation patterns across, across several layers of the brain. So then I would say that consciousness uh, is probably, basically is probably arising from this global activation, but it also strongly reflects this uh, self-monitoring, and that would give the link with, uh, with confidence itself. And that is, uh, Consciousness can be seen as, uh, as, uh, as made of uh, several uh, aspects. One of them is the self-monitoring, of which this confidence uh, judgment, this confidence uh, feeling that we have, the certainty feeling, is a direct reflection. And so with that, I would like to, uh, to thank and acknowledge my uh, collaborators both here in, uh, in Japan, especially Mitsuo Kawato and Aiko Izumi. Uh, I, I was the first uh, author of the, of the first studies I introduced. Then I would like also to thank uh, Hakuan Lau and uh, Vincent Tachot de Mouchel. He was the first author of the second study about um, reducing fears for common objects. And I would like to thank also the, our uh, funding agency, you for your attention. And I think now we can uh, open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Aurelio Cortez, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type your questions into the box that appears on your screen and click the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, what were participant strategies during the neural reinforcement sessions? Thank you for the question. So, interestingly, all participants reported uh, widely different um, strategies during this, uh, this reinforcement session. That is, they never reported uh, things that were related to the actual task in question. I think there were only two occasions among all the subjects for the three different studies, and those two were um, in, the, uh, in the study regarding the uh, 
conceptual representation of objects to reduce fear for objects, in which, if I'm not wrong, there were two participants that uh, somehow at, at some points thought about one of the two categories, but they never knew which one was the target, which one was the control. In all the other studies, strategies were ranging from, I was thinking about my lunch, uh, I was focusing on, on something, uh, I have to do sports, some training, I'm, I'm thinking about that, I'm doing mental calculations. So strategies were very different, but never involved the actual task. Thank you for that answer. Our next question is, in the second study where fear responses to common objects were reduced, did participants' fear ratings also change or was the effect purely physiological? That is a very interesting question because we see these um, strong physiological uh, uh, responses, that is, we have fear that is reduced specifically for the target um, stimulus, and in this case for the target object. But interestingly, when participants were uh, asked to rate their, uh, let's say, fear, or how uh, fearful were all the different categories, the target uh, and the control were rated equally as before the training. So there was no change in that sense. Now, there could be several reasons for that. But an interesting one, an interesting inter interpretation is that this neural reinforcement uh, training purely acts below the consciousness level. That is, we play with these uh, representations, we reinforce them. This has uh, a strong impact on the low level processing of this uh, uh, in the fear circuitry, but does not reach consciousness. Now, if, if, we, if we want to apply this for actual treatment of, of, of phobic patients, for example, then this could be actually a very uh, interesting approach because one could, could think of using first this uh, neural reinforcement, they call it neurofeedback technique, initially to decrease this, um, this uh, kind of condition or um, physiological responses. And then once these are, are, are lower or are more, let's say, amenable, then perhaps it should become easier to, to combine this with uh, some uh, cognitive uh, uh, therapy. Because one of the issues uh, with, with those kind of treatments let's say cognitive or with uh, uh, exposure therapy, is that there, there's a, there is a certain level of dropout. That is, it's, it's too, um, too fearful to just look repeatedly to these images. But now if, you're, if your brain has learned not to be at least implicitly fearful for this, then perhaps it, it could become easier to have this uh, also at the conscious level afterwards. Thank you for that answer. Our next question is, regarding the study on confidence, could the changes be accounted for by changes in mood or other unspecific effects? Interesting question, indeed. So we see there's uh, changes in confidence. And if those were purely changes uh, uh, of confidence, then we one way to uh, to actually prove this, and I I didn't show uh, I didn't show it here in the during my talk for the for the sake of time. But one of the analysis we did afterwards uh, was to look at um, meta D prime. So meta D prime is a uh, index of uh, metacognitive ability. That is, it not only assesses how confident you are, but it tracks uh, it. it but no, basically it tracks how confidence and, um, and uh, the accuracy in the task are linked on a trial-by-trial -trial basis. So normally, if one is, is, a, is a, has a high metacognitive sensitivity or ability, then you have a very strong relationship between, let's say, correct choices and high confidence and the incorrect choices and low confidence. Now, if... So if the change in confidence is just due to some form of, let's say, bias in the report or some mood effect, then we would just expect to have a general shift toward, let's say, higher or lower confidence, right? And if that were the case, we should not really see a change in this meta D prime because now it would be, it would just be basically a shift, a criterion shift. And what we do see is that at least for the high confidence training, we see 
a, uh, a significant reduction in the meta D prime. For the lower confidence, we don't see that. There could be several reasons. One of them is perhaps because um, uh, overall it could be more difficult to decrease, a, let's say, a function or a representation that is in this case confidence rather than increase it. Another interpretation is that the task itself is already difficult, it's already uh, ambiguous, so confidence is generally speaking already relatively low, so it's much easier to increase than decrease. Okay, we have time for one more question. Our last question is, given these results and adding to previous research, it seems local representations are not sufficient to create consciousness. Do you think it may be possible to utilize decoded neurofeedback to induce a conscious percept? Excellent. I think you, you got the point of that uh, we haven't managed yet to, uh, to get to, uh, let's say, creating a conscious percept. Now, with, with, we, with this neurofeedback uh, or these neural training approaches that we've been using so far, um, as I was uh, mentioning during the talk, these were always about localized, somehow localized representation. And this way it was not possible to create consciousness. But what we think is that if we can use this, uh, this technique, this, not only to induce or to reinforce localized activity, but also, let's say, some, some pattern of uh, um, kind of functional information transmission or some form of, uh, you know, information flow from between different areas as, as it is basically um, proposed in this uh, global uh, availability or global workspace uh, theory, then perhaps we could get at, at, that, uh, at that point to be able to, to actually uh, induce some uh, conscious percept. We are working toward that direction and we are devising several studies, some of them already being uh, on the work. So um, I think stay tuned and maybe in some um, not so distant future, we may be able to do that. I would like to once again thank Dr. Aurelio Cortese for his presentation. I would also like to thank Labrits for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June of 2018. You'll receive an email from Labrits letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.